Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us at Eagle Mount Church. I'm so excited that you're joining us online. You know, what a wonderful time for us to minister to you and for you to just be sitting there in your comfort at home and just being ministered to by the word of the Lord. What an amazing time we had in singing and in worship. You know, worship is something so important. God loves worship. You know, worship is like a sweet aroma that goes up like in smoke, you know, to God. And when God smells of it, he enjoys it and and worship is so essential because anything that you uh, true worship comes out of a revelation of what god actually did for you on that cross okay true worship is based out of the true comprehension of the love for G- uh, of jesus for you okay once you truly understand when i mean truly it just takes like a second of revelation you know it just it's just that one bit of revelation that you understand that my god jesus loves me he died for me on that cross and he would do it all over again just for one person and that if if that was you he would do it all over again just for you you know because that's how much he loves you but praise the lord god does not have to do it because hebrew says god once and for all has washed away and has justified all our sins so that is present past and future sins i want to emphasize on future so the moment you realize the the weight or the gravity of the love of god the only thing remaining for you to do is you fall flat on your face in worship that is one of the meanings for worship you know falling flat in telugu it's called sashtanga paradam you just fall flat on your face and that's that's just worshiping god and just as we worship god in our singing in our songs in our music there is another form of important worship that is the worship with giving you know we 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 know that we can never ever ever outgive god we say god what can i do for you that you have died for me on that cross no matter how much i do in my life i can never repay and don't even try to repay it you know don't say god because you died for me i want to do that's the wrong attitude you should go in worship you should say wow i i i see that's why we love because he first loved us we we only do worship because he first gave to us and because we have nothing else to do we we give god through our time we give god through our singing we give to god in our praises we give to god in our first fruits so i just want to talk to you a little bit about giving okay offering about sowing many times we just give religiously we just give traditionally but i realized that most of the times we don't know why we bring our offerings to the house of the lord it's unfortunate you know we don't know why why we have to tithe we know that we have to tithe we know that we have to bring offerings to the church we know that our money is 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 something that we need to put in that offering box but why we do not know how we do not know i i just want to cover that a little bit for you okay worship offering in the basic essence is uh, worship offering in the basic essence is worship and and uh, i just want to teach every time at the time of offering you know i just want to teach a few minutes on offering so that you have a revelation about why you are doing what you are doing okay it just be, we we don't do things just because we have to do that will become a religion that will become a ritual and it will be meaningless because christianity is not a ritual thing okay you cannot have a relationship but you have to i mean relationship is good but you have to seek to have a fellowship because that time it's two way you know you see it's from this side and from that side you get it both sides and and that's what i feel like having with god i have a fellowship with god i have communion with god because i i just don't want to have a relationship where he is existing and i am existing but we are both ignoring each other i mean of course god is not ignoring me but i am not uh, paying attention to him that's how most of the time we are because we have been taught religiously we have been taught a rich surely and we have been taught traditionally so just a few minutes let us go and look into why we bring our offerings to the house of the lord okay i hope you have your bibles if you do not have your bibles i'm uh, i'm sorry i have a few bibles in my room but i can't give it to you so go immediately bible is very important for you to check because what if i'm reading the wrong thing you know you have to always keep me in check so go get your bible go get your book go get your pen and then let's let's get prepared for this you know let's get prepared for this 
so there is something called the grain offering okay something called the grain offering in leviticus chapter 6 verses 14 i'm going to read just a few verses i'm not going to preach a lot on this just to give you a basic idea these are the regulations for the grain offering Aaron's sons are to bring it before the Lord in front of the altar. The priest is supposed to take a handful of the finest flour and some olive oil together with the incense on the grain offering and burn a memorial portion on the altar as a pleasing aroma. See, I told you, as a pleasing aroma, it's, it's, it's a sort of worship for God, okay? Pleasing aroma to the Lord. And I'm just skipping a few verses. And like the sin offering and the guilt offering, it is most holy. And the end of that word, end of verse 18 says, whatever or anything or anyone that touches them will become holy. See, worship, grain offering does not include blood. You see, this offering does not include blood. Because this offering is not about atonement. This offering is not about uh, washing your sins away or cleaning your sins. This offering is purely worship. And you just worship because you want to. You know, because you like to, because you get to. And and think about it, okay? grain was something that is so rare in this wilderness. In this wilderness, manna was coming. Why? Because they can't have a plantation in the wilderness. They are not growing potatoes, carrots and all of that. So grain is so important for them. So they must have stored it all up in the Egypt, uh, when, when they were slaves under Egyptians and when they had gotten the gold and the silver and all of that, you know, just before leaving out of Egypt, when they gathered all of that, they gathered all the grain also and they are storing it up. Why are they storing it up? Because these grains are all not only food for them at this time, but they are also a seed for them once they reach their promised land. You get it? This grain is, the, is basically the net worth of a family. Grain is constituting of a net worth of a family and the family's net worth is measured in how much grain they have because this grain can measure how much harvest they have in the promised land. Now imagine, okay, this grain is very important. You can't just waste grain because this is the grain that your, fam your son is going to uh, harvest. This is the grain that your grandson is going to live with. You know, this is, this is what they're going to use to eat. This is what they're going to use to do business. And Jews are big, big on business. Okay, so... Grain was something so important, but still they would come to God with grain in a wilderness. You see how crazy. That's what they have to eat with. That's what they have to do. First of all, you, how long are they going to eat manna? They are eating manna, but they are, see, that's the grain offering. It's so rare and they are bringing oil in the wilderness where they cannot make oil. I mean, of course they can make oil, but they'll consume all their grain. So it's one of the most expensive offerings that somebody can give to the Lord even more expensive than gold because gold can be got gold can can will, will gold will be there but this grain is going to multiply gold cannot do that this grain is going to increase and that gold can't do that so this has more value than gold and when they give it to God it's most holy and it will please God I just want to read another verse for you from Proverbs chapter Proverbs chapter 11 verses 24 and 25. There is the one who generous, generously scatters abroad and yet he increases all the more. And there is the other one who withholds what is justly due and it results only in want and poverty. The generous man is a source of blessing and shall be prosperous and be enriched. He who uh, and he who waters will himself be watered reaping the generosity that he has sown you know this is the sowing and reaping principle when a man will sow what he's reaped you know karma is actually instituted from the bible karma is actually instituted from the bible so what you sow you will reap what goes around comes around definitely 100 percent. that is a that is an institution set by the word now i'll read nld translation of the same verse give freely and become more wealthy be stingy and lose everything the generous will prosper and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed are you understanding okay now you think about this okay we are in a time where we are in a sort of a wilderness. We are in a crisis where nothing is coming easy. We are losing our jobs. Some of the people have been laid off from work. Some of the people have not been getting full salaries. This is the time where we are really calculating how much we withhold from ourselves. But remember, okay, the one who withholds is the one who ends up in want and poverty. 
but be very careful okay be very careful to understand how much you are withholding and how much you are giving see that's why in 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 um, isaac isaac when he was in gerar uh, it was a place that was not it was a place that was famine place you know it was a place that does not have water or fruit right now and god said hey remain in this place of famine remain in this place of wilderness and isaac did something crazy when there is famine he sowed in the land when there is famine you don't sow because that's what famine is and when there was famine isaac sowed in that land and because he had the promise he the bible says in genesis chapter 26 you can go ahead and read it that he um, he uh, harvested 100 fold he harvested 100 fold because in the time of crisis your aroma smells greater to the lord because you are not obliged to give the grain offering but you bring it to the lord just because you want to just because you want to it, it you are not you are not uh, it is not mandatory but you do it because you can you do it because you love god you do it because you want to worship god and i just want to read one more verse okay in this way first timothy chapter 6 verses 19 in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life laying up and laying hold this way they will lay up treasure see laying up means to give laying hold is to receive giving and receiving giving and receiving and here it says take that they may take hold of the life that is truly life you know this is talking about eternal life but eternal life doesn't necessarily have to count all the time of the life after death in heaven it is life and life more abundant it is life of peace life of shalom life of enrichment life of prosperity and this is the kind of life that you will have when you give and this is a biblical principle you know giving comes from the heart you know if you give one rupee from the heart of a worshipper is much more valuable than a billion rupees from a, a heart of a man who just gives ritually you know a ritual does not have meaning but a rupee with worship oh it holds it's the most holy smelling aroma for the lord so let's all just come to the lord with our giving let's just come to the lord with our offering you know bring your offering to the house of the lord you can sow into this church you can sow wherever you please but you know the most important thing is you are sowing you are laying up you are giving okay that is the most important thing and also in corinthians it says remember whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly who sows generously will reap generously each one should give what you have decided in your heart to give um the lord the holy spirit will reveal to you what is the amount you should give and when you give give cheerfully and do not be ashamed of a small seed do not be ashamed of a small uh, sowing because don't underestimate the value of a seed that seed can be your per- imagine a uh, one seed can grow a, a a tree that will bear fruit for generations and generations so never underestimate the power of a seed so hold your seed in your hand hold your seed in your hand and just say this after me okay speak it after me say father thank you so much for the ability that i'm able to sow thank you so much that i have the, gen- gen- the, the i have the capability of sowing right now and i sow because i love you i worship you with my giving so that lord i give and i will receive i lay up and i will lay hold i will i will i will i will sow and i will i will reap my harvest father that in this time of crisis because of your promise because of your word i will have a good measure for everything i will have a, a over and abound of whatever i'm believing for i i believe for whatever is happening in this crisis i will not lack i will not be in poverty neither will i be in want neither will i be in a place of 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 a compromise because father your word works for me as it worked for isaac as it worked for abraham as it worked for everybody else in the word of the lord thank you so much for the uh, for this promise father i sow in faith in jesus name amen if you prayed that prayer you know expect in uh, i mean wait in expectation wait in expectation tell god right now how much you want your harvest to be uh, you just round that figure up you know if you want 1000 rupees round it up you know on the bigger side go to 1500 rupees say god i want 1500 bucks if you are sowing so with with your harvest in mind so with worship in mind so with god in mind so that that is the most important factor you are giving in faith so thank you so much i believe that you have uh, you uh, have 
understood you know the the why we do what we do uh, in giving especially why we worship in offering especially anyway today i wanted to talk to you about mistakes into miracles god will turn your mistakes into miracles so often okay how many times do we feel so i mean how many times do we feel so guilty because we have done some mistake and we think that god cannot work in our lives because we have done something wrong and because we have done something wrong we judged the mood of god we'll say oh my god my god must be a little angry with me you know my god must be a little sad must be disappointed in me that and that's what when and you are not wrong for feeling like that because i think that's how most uh, that the human tendency of just feeling of being embarrassed of ourselves of being guilty and ashamed that we do not have uh, the approval of our father because of our actions and that's and that's something that um, we all struggle with at some point of time and we all feel like our mistakes our consequences are on us they are definitely on us but how is our god's attitude towards our mistakes i mean it's 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 different thing to be wronged by others it's a different thing that a person is unfair to me that's a different game but what if i did something and i am reaping what i have sown which is i sowed a mistake for example but how is god going to react is god going to let me suffer throughout today i want to talk to you about your mistakes are being turned into miracles your mistakes are being going turned into something glorious that even your mistake will work for the glory of the lord think about a mistake that you have done you know when i was in uh, college uh, i i must have done a lot of foolish things but those foolish things that i have done when i was in college when i was in my teenagers i mean teenage or when i was in in all of that you know all those things actually turned out to be a miracle that today i'm standing here that i'm loving god so much more because he who is forgiven much loveth much so because i know of my past i know of the light of because when the when it is darker it is brighter it is most bright when it's more darker so so i really understand that god had changed my miracle i mean my mistakes into miracles and he's willing to do that for you as well so um let's just open our bibles i hope you have brought your bibles if you do not go bring your bible right now or open your phone and um, let's all open to joshua chapter 9 okay joshua chapter 9 and i just want to say a few things just before we start reading yeah i just want to say a few things just before we start reading so many people right they look at us and they will scoff they will mock and they will ridicule us because of something that we did unmindfully they will laugh at us it can be our mother it can be our father and it hurts because we know that we did wrong we know that what we did is a stupid move we we made a nonsensical move it doesn't make sense it doesn't add up but still we did it we just did it you know you you know what i'm talking about you just did it but but when people keep scoffing at you and when keep people keep laughing at you and when you feel like there is no way of, about you you know going about it and then you just don't even want to go to god you don't want to go to your parents you don't want to go to your friends because you know that you have been foolish at that point you know i feel like that point is the point where god is going god is using that point as a threshold for you to shoot you up into a place that you have never imagined okay god god is a wonder working god and god is a father you know that's the thing you know so when i was in college i i used to do a lot of things which don't really add up to my father don't really add up to my mother and yet even though he's angry with me you know we would still go end up eating in a restaurant after that parent teacher meeting we would still go end up having lunch in a place that is amazing and and then my father would just forget about it and it i would have a tough time forgetting about it and i don't even remember i don't think my father is ignoring it but he would just forget about it and that's just so interesting to me because i feel like in this case my my father was a reflection of the heavenly father who who knows who is not ignorant towards what i have done wrong but he still chooses to bless me in my wrong so let's all open to joshua chapter 9 and just let's just start reading okay 
And it came to pass when all the kings who were on this side of Jordan, in the hills, in the lowland and the coasts of the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hevite and the Jebusite. So six people, six kings, six tribes, okay? Let's just call them tribes because they are calling them by the tribes, okay? Let me read that again. The Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hevite and the Jebusite heard that heard about uh, what Joshua just did to the Jericho walls, what Joshua just did to the town of Ai and the city of Ai and they, he, they're like, dang it, man, this Joshua has got some muscle on him. He's got something called a God with him. And these guys just, uh, these guys just became into a union and they gathered together to fight with Joshua and Israel with one accord. So these are six kingdoms, okay, six. I don't know that's how you say six, but like just six, okay, six kingdoms. They came together to fight with Israel and with Joshua with one accord. Now the idea is because Joshua literally shot, I mean, literally burnt up the previous cities. He, I was just done. He killed that king and he put him for everybody to see at the outside of the gate. And that king was just dead and he could not do anything. I was just, just done, you know, and I supposed to be one of the greater cities. So fine, these six people, the six tribes, they kind of came to fight with Joshua. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon, so this Gibeon is a geographical area and it is inhabited by a tribe called the Hevites, okay? I, 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 this is usually confusing, okay? We think Hivite is a country and the people who are living in Hivites are Hivites, you know, like Indian, India, all of that. But no, this is, Gibeon is a geographical area and it is inhabited by the tribe called Hivites. Now, Hivites, Gibeonites, okay? They are called Gibeonites because they inhibit uh, Gibeon and they are Hivites because they are of the tribe of Hivites. So, I hope that makes sense to you. So, fine. They gathered together to fight with, with Israel and when the inhabitants of Gibeon, that are the Hivites, heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they worked craftily. Say, they worked craftily. Say, they worked craftily. Okay? And went and pre pretended to be ambassadors and they took old sacks on their donkeys, old wineskins, torn and mended. Torn and mended. Old and patched sandals on their feet old garments on themselves and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy so now these guys are thinking crafty you know because these guys are next on the hit list of joshua and uh, these guys try to act smart okay first of all they are sub they are uh, they have five other friends that they want to go and fight with joshua but these guys are making another plan okay this is a secret plan these these guys are trying to go and uh, deceive their other friends okay because they want something for themselves. Now these um, these Gibeonites, they went, okay, and they went to Joshua, verse 6, chapter 9, verse 6, if you're not there. And they went to Joshua to the camp at Gilgal, and they said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a far country. They did not, okay, they are not. I hope you know that already. So they have come from a far country. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us, Joshua. Please look at us, Josh. Look at us, man. My 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 slippers are worn away. You see how far that is. I, my slippers don't usually get worn away. I use them for years on together. I don't know for how long they were walking. Okay, their slippers were worn away. Their wine sacks were dry. They're almost broken. Everything. You look at them, and they just worked so craftily to put forth a presentation to Joshua that they want to convince him that they have traveled from somewhere far away. And they went to Joshua, we have come from somewhere far away. Now, therefore, make a covenant with us. And the men of Israel said to the Hevites, okay, Hevites are the people who are inhabiting Gibeon. Perhaps, he's saying to uh, them, perhaps among, uh, come on, I think I missed a line. Yeah, perhaps you dwell among us. And so how can we make a covenant with you? See, the God of Israel said, hey, Israelites, you are my promised generation. You know what you're supposed to do? Drive out every single person from those lands. Drive out every single person. Don't kill everybody. That's what he did to Jericho and that's what he did to I. Kill every single person. Everybody dead. Man, woman, child, everybody. Because that was, that was the promised land for Israel. And, and these guys were supposed to just kill everybody and not make peace with anybody. And then he's saying, hey, perhaps you live among us. How can we make a covenant with you? But they said to Joshua, we are your servants, Josh. And Joshua said to them, who are you and where did you come from? And they said to him, 
from a very far country your servants have come from because of the name of the Lord your God for we have heard of his fame and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond so they heard all of that okay therefore our elders and our inhabitants of a country spoke among us and said take provisions with you for the journey and go and meet them and said to them we are your servants now therefore make a covenant with us look Josh this is our bread of us that we took hot for our provision from our houses on the day we departed to come to you but now look it is dry and moldy and these are the wine skins which we have filled from where they are uh, from filled which were new and see they are uh, filled uh, they are torn and have and these are the garments which we are sandals have become very old and because of our very long journey then the men of israel took some of their provisions but they did not ask the counsel of the lord it's it's amazing how this how the bible highlights the mistake of joshua the mistake of the elders of joshua they did not ask the counsel of the lord they did not ask the counsel of the lord see when in the in the town of ai when they went for battle joshua and they lost a few men because of somebody akan because of akan he came and he took some of the cursed goods and Joshua immediately went and he asked God, Hey God, what's happening, man? What's, what's going on? And God saying, Get up, get up. Listen, there's somebody. Go, go do something. And God and Joshua had such a relationship, you know, that sometimes I feel like Joshua is just sitting there and crying and God is like, Why are you doing this? Because he does that in the previous chapter. And then in this chapter, somehow Joshua just doesn't ask God. And by, the Bible is clearly highlighting, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. So Joshua made treaty made peace with them and made covenant with them to let them live and the rulers of the congregation swore to them three days later the elders and the people of israel go and they find out that these guys are not coming from a faraway country but they actually put on an act they put out an act and the next verse says the and all of the congregation murmured against the leaders see the leaders took a decision without asking the Lord. And the Israelites, now the congregation, everybody um, under the leadership, okay, is now murmuring against the leader. How many times, I don't know if you're in a leadership position, how many times as a leader must you have taken a, 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 must you have taken a decision that none of your people liked, none of your people enjoyed? And these guys are continuously murmuring against you. But you have to keep your word. You have made a covenant. You have made, you have given them a word and, and, and words are very important. Think about that. Making a mistake and facing the consequences. First being complaining. Second being murmuring. Third being rubbing it in your face. And I don't really enjoy that. Because that's not something that I want to experience. I don't want people to rub my mistakes in my face. But that's exactly what's happening. And the congregation murmured against them. So now what happens, I'm not going to read the entire thing because it's going to take a long time to read the entire thing. But you can go and see, read it, okay? And the rulers of the congregation said, see, we have sworn, we can't do much to them. We have to just, you know, make them woodcutters. Let's just make them our servants. Fine. Then we once we go down, okay? Um, Joshua goes and asks them why. And they say, see, this is what I really like about the Bible, okay? And they say, see, Joshua, because your servants were clearly told that God, your God, commanded his servant Moses to give all this land and to destroy all the inhabitants of this land before you. Therefore, we were very much afraid of our lives because of you have done such a thing. When people see that you have a God, when people see, that's why when, when the Ark of the Covenant would come, people would get scared. When God is in your life, people should just shake and fear. People just see, hey, this man means business. This man is not a normal man that we can mess with, you know. Then that's exactly what, that's exactly how your life is. And when, when you are walking, the spiritual, see, we do not war against flesh and blood, but we war against principalities and powers. And when you come as a, pre, as a mass, as a, as a, son of god holding the presence in your in your life when you walk even the principalities and the powers they get scared because you have the covenant inside of you you have god inside of you and christ is inside of you the hope of glory and the moment this hevites they saw that hey this god that they are having man this god is not something normal so we better go do whatever it is we put on a crafty act and then we just do whatever let's cheat them let's deceive them and let's just spare ourselves our lives and that's exactly what they did. 
your prosperity and your god will be visible to others you don't need to talk so much about your god you know you, your life will show others your god your life and your 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 walk with god will show others your your god your boldness and your courage and your neck will show other people that you have a god when you talk in confidence when you talk in boldness when you say hey no weapon that is formed against me will prosper and and i'm see i'm not talking about arrogance i'm not talking about foolishness you know i'm talking about a knowledge of the living god that's exactly what elijah did you know he had the knowledge of the living god in his hands and nothing could shake this man and that's exactly what moses did when he went to pharaoh and he saying hey man pharaoh check this out you have to let my people go and the confidence at which moses spoke you know the entire egyptian people also looked up to moses that's because he knew his god he knew and other people can see that in you but fine okay these guys did a mistake so now the story gets interesting okay remember the six six people who tried to do the hivites parasites amorites all of those guys now these are the six guys and one of them the hivites cheated all of these six and went and made a pact now these guys lives are spared now these guys they can't go make a treaty because joshua is now in his senses now so he doesn't want to make a treaty with these guys so now he's definitely going to kill all of these guys but he spared one of these guys friends so now who is angry with who the five guys are angry with gibeon the five guys are angry with the hivites and now these five guys have a war with these guys they are saying hey you have cheated me and you have without telling us at least you should have told us we would have come and made a treaty with you right why did you just leave us out of this business that you did and these guys were completely angry and then see this something interesting now it came to pass when adonai z a king of jerusalem had heard how joshua had taken ai and utterly destroyed it so he had, so also he had done to ai and its king and how the inhabitants of gibeon had made peace with israel and uh, that and were among them that they greatly feared because gibeon was a city like one of the royal cities now think okay the hivites were royal people they were among the they were greater than i and they were men their men were mighty even the mighty men because you have a god see now think these guys were slaves okay they didn't have much education but they had god and these guys are mighty they didn't have god and the mighty men bow down to the slave of egyptians because of their god when people see you they don't see your background they don't see your history but they have to see your god that's how you have to walk so now they were so fearful and then adonai zed king of uh, jerusalem sent hokam so the, this guy basically saying hey come and help me for we should go and attack gibeon for it had made peace with joshua and with the children of israel therefore the five kings of the amorites the king of jerusalem and the king of hebron and the king of jamut and the king of lachish and the king of eglon and uh, gathered together and went up they and all their armies and they camped before gibeon and made war against it now this is not joshua's war think about it. this is not joshua's war joshua is not in this war why because joshua's business is only he could just stay out of this right he could have definitely stayed out of this this is not joshua's war this is a war between a person who treated his friends and this person is not even of israel it's uh, the gibeonites trade uh, traded all these five other guys they made treaty with joshua now out of jealousy these guys are making war to him now the gibeonites see something very interesting okay now the gibeonites okay uh, come up to me and they gather to make war and the men of gibeon sent to joshua the camp at gilgal saying hey Josh do not forsake us your servants come up to us quickly and save us and help us for the king of the amorites who dwell in the mountains have gathered together against us now think of what joshua would be feeling okay joshua made a covenant joshua made a mistake joshua did not seek the lord and i want to think about how embarrassed joshua would have been how shameful joshua would have been he's a new leader and he's filling up the shoes of moses and everybody loved moses you know everybody honored moses and moses was a mighty man red sea all of that moses had a lot in his in his resume and now this is joshua new new guy and then suddenly this is only joshua chapter 9 he made a mistake and i i would wonder you know when he heard the message from gibeon saying hey do not forsake us you know these people are coming to war for us come save us come rescue us i don't know i don't know what kind of a spirit he had he must have had a oh, man i just wish i had asked god i have to go fight a war that is not even mine because i made a treaty in my ignorance the consequences of a mistake 
Joshua just could not. I feel like at that moment, Joshua would have been having his hand on his head and just was like, I wish I could just go back in time, you know. How many of us feel like that? And then, and then, so Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war, with him and all the mighty men of valor. Joshua is going up now. He and his men doesn't really want to do this job. And if you realize, till now, Joshua did not communicate with God because he was embarrassed. Till now, Joshua did not say, hey God, come help me Lord, I did a mistake. Because Joshua was sad, he was embarrassed, he could not do anything. And God, God, going to God would mean embarrassment and shame. Right? That's what we all think. But you know, check out the next verse, Joshua chapter 10 verses 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, who was the first one to communicate? Who was the first one to communicate? God communicated, not Joshua. Joshua didn't go to God, give 20,000 burnt offerings, say, oh Lord, I'm so sorry, God. I mean... I did a mistake, I should have contacted you, I should have, I should have clarified with you, I should have checked with you. Those would, have, those would have all would be great things to have done. But Joshua did not even go to God because he was so embarrassed. And now God is the first one to communicate with Joshua. In your mistake, God is still with you. God is walking by you because I'll tell you something interesting because after the cross you and Christ have become one so your middle name is now Christ and don't get don't shout me down when I'm saying Christ because Christ means the anointed so right now my middle name is Christ Sharad Christ Yelisiri Sharad the anointed fellow Sharad the anointed Christ means the anointed I have Christ in me so right now my mistakes are like Jesus' mistakes And, and even though I was the author of my mistake, even though I was the man who's doing the mistake, when I'm walking into the mistake, Jesus is with me. We feel like God has left us. But no, God has never left us. God is always with us. And God is right with us. And he's walking the mistake with us. He's walking through us, strengthening us, equipping us to go and make something and change our mistake into miracle. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear, for I have delivered them into your hand. Do not fear, Josh, I have delivered them. Do not fear, Josh, your mistake is not a mistake. And you know what? I will come and I will I'll work out your mistake with you. Do not. I have delivered them to you. Not a man of them shall stand before you. None of them, Josh. None of them. Let's go do it. None of them shall stand before you. None of them. Let's go do it. Imagine a grumpy Joshua. Spirit right now must be like a lion. Now the lion inside of Joshua is standing up and it's roaring. It's like, ah, my mistake, Lord, you have changed it. Now you are the lion inside of me and you're telling me, Lord, that my promise to them in ignorance of you is going to work out for the good that right now those People of Gibeon, I mean, who are coming against Gibeon are going to be dead in my hands because my promise has suddenly become your promise. My word has suddenly become your word. My word is your word. And you know what? God didn't have to do that. Because this was on Joshua. But that is the heart of God. That is the heart of God. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And why did he have to choose a time where Joshua is doing a mistake? And why did God have to choose a time like this to come and show himself up? And if you read the next chapter, we'll go, we'll go through it. Uh, God did it in style, you know. God did it in style. And God defended a promise that was not supposed to be. So these are, these are the people, the Gibeonites are the people that God first intended to be killed. And now God is helping Joshua defend the Gibeonites and go against war of the others. Weird, isn't it? But Joshua and God were one. God and Joshua become one. Now they are defending Gibeon. And check this out. I have delivered them to you, not a man of them shall stand before you. Joshua therefore came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. 
check this out okay now the lord is also fighting the war lord is not helping joshua fighting the war but lord is also fighting with joshua in the war understood god is not enabling joshua to do better but god himself is there with joshua to enhance the war so he's saying the lord routed them before israel killed them who killed them the lord the lord routed them before israel killed them with a great slaughter at gibeon chased them along the road that goes to beth horon and struck them down as far off esekha and makada you know if you see the distance i'll i'll give you this work okay go and see how much how far is that road and you will be surprised that god actually did that you know those people were chased and and imagine chasing somebody for that far the strength of the lion inside of you the lion of judah inside of you that because your mistake has is being turned into a miracle that because your promise has become god's promise fine and it happened as they fled before israel and they were on the descent of beth horon and the lord cast down large hailstones from heaven on them Lord cast down see I told you Lord was not enabling Joshua to fight but the Lord was also a fighter in this war he's he cast down hailstones there were far more who died from the hailstone than the children of Israel killed see suddenly the children of Israel the father figure embracing the mistake of the child of Israel don't mess with a person who has a father who is angry because that father is going to come for you i was watching a movie okay uh, and and uh, there was there were a few bullies okay and uh, the bullies will come and always bully this child all the time and this child would never tell the father i mean this is one of the most common things that happen in hollywood you go you go see a movie and and the child just comes and comes home crying doesn't need to tell the dad anything just that tear tear eyed look enrages the father so much the father gets so angry built up with rage goes to the bullies of course i'm not encouraging this but i'm showing you the heart of the father the passion of the father towards his children far more people died of the hailstorm hailstones than uh, the children of israel killed fine it is the mistake of children uh, the children of israel the children of israel should be bearing more consequences why is god fighting a battle and why did god not why did god take up the consequences of the uh, mistake and he himself is fighting more harder he himself is doing much greater job than israel he himself now so many times we are led to believe that our life once after we have done a mistake is just a mistake god is so far away from man you are uh, you need rehab you need a counselor you need discipleship you need all that tell them you know i have a father in heaven who loves me i have a father in heaven who loves me you might remember my past but my god remembers my past differently my god sees the past to make that past into a miracle so that my mistake will be into a miracle that till now that world has never seen check this out and then joshua spoke to the lord in the day when the lord delivered up to the uh, delivered up the amorites before the children of israel and he said in the sight of israel sun stand over gibeon and moon in the valley of ajalon so the sun stood and the moon stopped till the people had revenge upon their enemies and there has been no day like that before it or after it and the lord heeded the voice of man for the lord fought for israel then joshua returned then joshua and all of israel returned with him to the camp at gilgal and of course all the people were slaughtered the five kings in verse 20 it happened that uh, slaying them with a very great slaughter happened in verse 21 it says no one moved his tongue against the children of israel they could not i mean the the, the kings couldn't say nothing and once when joshua 
got hold of those five kings. Okay, see verse 22. Once Joshua got those five kings to him, he said, hey, five kings, check this out. I have a God. I have a promise. And by this time, Joshua's lion inside of him is still roaring. Joshua's spirit is on fire. It's like fire stuck up in his bones. Because God said, hey, Joshua, do not fear. And you know, in the beginning of the covenant that Joshua had, God says to Joshua, in the beginning, Joshua chapter 1, if you go and see, he says, Josh, do not fear. Josh, do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is telling Joshua, do not be afraid. Do not be uh, dismayed. For I am with you wherever you go. Be of good courage. And in verse, in chapter 9, Joshua kind of forgot that. He forgot that the Lord is with him at all the times. He lost his courage. He lost his, his boldness. He lost and he became fearful. But once God said, again, he reminded him, hey man, do not fear. That's it. He now remembers the word that came to him in the beginning of his walk as the leader of Israel. And then he goes, and then Joshua, wait, he, verse 24 I'm reading from. So it was when they brought the kings to Joshua that Joshua called the men of Israel and he said to the captains of the men of war who went with him, come on, come near and put your feet on the necks of these kings and draw near and uh, Come near and put your feet on the necks of these kings. And they drew near and put their feet on the necks. Then Joshua said, see, check this out. He's repeating what God actually told him. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Joshua is now telling the other people saying, hey, put your neck, leg feet upon your enemies. And that's how. How God is going to fight your enemies. He's going to make you a person who was a slave in Egypt, make you a person who's stepping on the king's, uh, king's necks because the Lord is with you even though you have done a mistake. And no matter what, he is with you. Wherever you go, he is with you. Whatever you do, he is with you. Whatever mistake you have done, he is with you. How many people tell you that? And then he drew his sword and he killed them. He drew his sword and he killed them. And then on, Joshua went on to be one of the biggest faith figures in the Bible. Joshua was like the man. And then in verse 29, Joshua comes back into his form. He forgets everything. So many times we know that the sun stood still in Joshua's uh, war we know that the moon stood still and history proves it you can go check it up you can go google it it does not add up the days don't add up and you can go see it and 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 hi history proves it and science proves it that the earth just stopped rotating and for what did the earth stop rotating to support the mistake of joshua to support the ignorance of joshua to to support the promise of joshua to a person who's supposed to be killed your mistake is going to be into a miracle. Your mistake, God, will turn into a miracle. See, I'm not much of a TV guy. But there was this one TV show that I loved. It's called Person of Interest. And in that scene, there is a fight, there is a war between two artificial intelligent agents. Okay, Two artificial intelligences are fighting themselves. And these artificial intelligence is like God in that TV series. Okay, It's like God. It knows everything. It knows, it can calculate uh, anything, you know. And, 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 and there are so many outcomes that it can, possible outcomes that it can come out with to help you create a strategy. And there is one particular dialogue that I would just like to read you, uh, read out to you that, of course, is in the series. And it says, in, this is talking about chess, okay. And it says, I thought you wanted to teach me how to play chess. Each possible move represents a different game. A different universe in which you can make a better move. By the second move, there are 72,084 possible games. And by the third move, 9 million. And by the fourth, 
there are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the universe. No one could possibly predict them all, even you, which means that the first move can be terrifying. It is the furthest point from the end of the game. That is virtually, and there is virtually an infinite sea of possibilities between you and the opposite side. But it also means that if you make a mistake, there is nearly an infinite amount of ways to fix it. So you should simply relax and play. If there is, if that, if God can do that with chess, how much more your life? How much more your life? Maybe this whole corona situation is not God brought. It's definitely not God brought, in fact. God never brings forth a wicked thing over his children. My father would never come to me and he would, he would give me a spoiled packet of bread and say, hey, make yourself bread and jam. Never. He would never do that even if he was very angry with me. Because that is just not the heart of my father. How much more my heavenly father? How much more him? He would never bring upon this kind of coronavirus, upon all of this. This is definitely something that man brought upon himself. This was a mistake. Man's ignorance, man's everything, all of that. And because of Joshua, because of one leader, the entire city of Israel was murmuring. And because of maybe one person's mistake, the entire world right now is suffering. But you know what? This mistake of one man can be changed into a miracle because our God is with us wherever we go. And you know what we'll do? We'll just raise our hands and put our feet upon the coronavirus and say, Hey, you know what, Corona? This is exactly what my God will do to my enemies. I will have my feet on their necks. That's exactly what you should do. There is a million infinite possibilities out of a mistake of a man for a miracle to be born. Are you having faith that your mistake is going to be a miracle? I have. None of us are, are except, I mean, exempt from this mistake making thing. You know, we all make mistakes. But just because we have made a mistake, doesn't make our father far, doesn't put our father far away from us our father's heart is not influenced by your actions our father is where, with you wherever you go and you have been made righteous on that cross are you understanding you have been made righteous on that cross proverbs chapter 4 verses 20 to 23 to 24 says keep these words inside of your heart that these will be life with you. Don't forget the words that are, are preached right now. Don't forget the words that are going into your hearts right now. Because if you forget these words, though if you if, if these words are just gone away from your heart, these the, the things that occupy your heart will rot your life. Because you will start going into fear again. You'll start going into discouragement again. You'll start going into anxiety again. But if you have the word of the Lord inside of you, in your heart, and when you guard this word of the Lord, no matter what news comes, it, it has to bounce back. No matter who comes, it has to bounce back. Because this word inside of you will make you into a lion. The same lion of Judah you will become into. And whatever comes at you, you roar. Because you have that authority. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. I just want to pray. Father, thank you so much for the lions that are watching this, Lord. Thank you for so much, Father. Lord, I bless them, Lord. I bless them with the blessing that is upon me. I bless them that the, with the blessing that is upon Jesus. So that, Father, with this blessing, they will walk. And they will, and they will know that their future holds full of possible miracles, Lord. That their, 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 their life is just going to be on a flip side, Lord. In fact, in this crisis, in this wilderness, they are going to experience their uh, miracle. In this time of... Uh, Lack, they are going to experience and eat of their prosperity, Father, because that's the God you are. That is the man you are. That is the promise maker you are. You are so powerful, so much more powerful than my mistake. So, Father, whoever is watching them, this uh, this uh, sermon right now, I pray for that person. I bless that person and I bless his sphere of influence. That, Lord, when he goes anywhere, the people who are looking at him or her, they know, hey, this man is walking with the covenant inside of him. Him. This man is walking with his God inside of him. He, he came from a very poor family. He came from a very poor, all of that doesn't matter. 
your background of slavery doesn't matter where you were in your past doesn't matter do you have god is what matters so say with me i have god inside of me the same spirit that raised christ from up the dead is inside of me and is giving life to my mortal bodies that i wherever i go i will tread on these uncharted territories that i will tread like a lion i will walk like god and even if it's water i will tread on it no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper i i will be a uh, head and not the tail i will always be above and not beneath i will be a blesser and not a receiver i will i will i will be a lender and not a borrower i will be a person of a kingly dominion through christ who is inside of me and i will never submit to the ways of the devil and i pray this prayer in the mighty name of jesus Amen. Amen. Hold the bread in your hand. It's time for us to partake in the communion of the Lord. You know, the communion that we have is 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 a is a remembrance of what God has done on that cross for you and for me. It's it's like a wedding ring. It's it's not it's actually more than a wedding ring. It just puts us in remembrance. It puts our mind, it aligns our it's uh, our entire mental and spiritual compass to see what God has done for us on that cross. And the moment we remember what God has done on the cross, our mind is renewed to our new identity, to our newborn identity that right now you and I are you and I don't need to submit to the world. you and i don't need to be afraid of the news that's happening you and i don't need to worry about what's going on because the bread the body has been broken for you it has been broken because of this broken body you are now a man that is enjoying of the things you know when christ said my god my god why have you forsaken me god forsook the god god himself was forsaken from the father figure so much so that he had to cry out god why have you forsaken me you know death is the separation of god and when jesus was screaming out my god my god why have you forsaken me jesus was going through the valley of the shadow of death he was experiencing that death you know god forsook jesus until jesus experienced death so that he never has to forsake you so that you can have life but nobody none of us feel like we are having life hey man don't be moved by what you feel don't be moved by what you see come on faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things unseen unseen unfelt unexperienced that body has been broken for you that right now you have this life giving uh um a uh, 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 full of life overflowing body that you are filled with you are equipped with you are covered with so partake of this blood my uh, bread and then say by his stripes i am healed with this body my organs my stomach my lungs my brain my eyes my mouth my tongue all of it is made well because jesus was cursed for me on that cross and i shall never face of that curse but i shall always be a life bearer patika the blood of jesus christ so many think right now that corona virus is somehow a judgment of god for the people's sins that cannot be far from the lie that cannot be any more far from a lie you see this is not the blood see some people think that that some people think that this this is the blood some people think you know that this corona virus situation is like a judgment from god that cannot be further from the truth when jesus was dead on that cross he died for the entire world past present and future that includes the worst person on this face of the earth and you know that worst person's sins have been forgiven too the judgment of this entire world's sins have been exhausted on that cross this blood is what washed it 
every single judgment for sin has been exhausted on that cross even though that person has not been born again even his sins have have been washed the only thing he has to do is come and accept that gift just because he did not accept that gift doesn't mean it's not washed it was washed but he did not appropriate it to himself so the judgment for sin has been dealt with this coronavirus situation is not from god because the blood of jesus has redeemed you from the curse of the law say this after me i am the righteousness of I god in christ to that. sorry about that guys say this after me i am the righteousness of god in christ this blood is the blood of god and it flows in your veins it flows in your heart and it is the one blood that gives you righteousness patik Father thank you so much for the people who have watched this. Thank you so much for the people who have partook in the holy communion and who have a renewed identity of who they are for you father. We are your children and we are loved by you. Thank you so much that you are our god. Thank you so much that we have you and thank you so much because we are expecting and waiting in expectation for our miracles from our mistakes thank you jesus we love you in jesus name i pray amen thank you so much for watching us uh, people of eagle mount church and if you are watching us for the first time you know send me a message write to us and we'd love to hear from you we'd love to pray with you and you know we'd love to even get to know you and if you want to partner with us there's information down in the description you can just hit us up i'm so happy and i'm so excited that you have watched this i i hope that you have been encouraged i know that you have been encouraged i hope that the lion of judah inside of you is roaring because your miracle is in the making your mistake is the miracle your mistake is going to be a miracle praise the lord see you next week the